Hello, my name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm president of the Souza Mendez Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you to this program, which is our first program of the new year, 2021. And let's hope that this is a much better year than the one we've just left in the rear view mirror. So our foundation honors a hero, a rescuer named Aristides de Souza Mendez. And what he did was during World War II in 1940, he was the Portuguese consul general stationed in Bordeaux, France. And he saw this mass of refugees coming into that city of Bordeaux who were escaping Belgium and France and all of the places that the Nazis had invaded up until that point. He was confronted with this mass of humanity and he knew that he could make a difference in their lives, but his government had forbidden him from helping them with an edict called Circular 14. And so what Sousa Mendes did was he defied this very explicit order and he rescued an estimated 30,000 refugees. The numbers are disputed, but it's in that order of magnitude against the orders of his government and he was harshly punished. So we celebrate his memory and we celebrate the lesson which is that one person of conscience and of moral courage can make a difference. Since the COVID period began, we have been running a series of Sunday programs on beautiful stories of rescue, resistance, and hope. And today is one such program. It's called The Jewish James Bond and Other Heroes. And this is a program that Boaz Devere and I sort of cooked up together after his sensational previous appearance in our series. And there was so much demand for hearing more and more and more of Boaz's stories that we created today's program and brought in these two very special guests, Sandra Brown, whose father, Sam Lewis, was a hero pilot who participated in the effort that we're going to hear about today to rescue the newborn state of Israel. And Yehuda Arazi is the grandson of his namesake. He, he is the namesake of his grandfather, who was the Jewish James Bond. Uh, and he was also King of the Ruses. And there's a book by that name all about his life. So right now, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Boaz Devere, and he's going to give us some context, and then he's going to introduce our two speakers when it's their turn to speak. So Boaz, take it away. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Matt. Thank you to the Souza Mendes Foundation. Thank you so much, Sandra and Yehuda, for joining us. And for all of you, wow, what, what a nice crowd. So yeah, I'm a storyteller. I love telling stories. And thank you for hanging out and hearing some more stories today. But there's got to be a point, right? It can't just be stories. So what's the point? The point is that as much as we celebrate individuals uh, who really have made a huge difference, and I've really devoted my life to studying them, actually. So I'm not taking anything away from that. But as much as we do that, we need to, at the same time, look at the people on their teams. Because Often, no matter how visionary or innovative uh, or charismatic the leader may be, if, if he doesn't or if she doesn't have the right people around them, it's not going to go very far. That's the truth. I mean, look, look what's happening right now. Look at Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed is a perfect example, I believe, of this notion. You had the innovators coming up with vaccines at, at unbelievably record time. I mean, just breaking any record that anyone could even conceive of. And now the distribution is, you know, limping along. So the teams around these leaders, around these people we celebrate are really key. And in the case of Operation Zebra, and I'll remind everyone what that is. If you do know, you'll, you'll hear it again. If you don't, we'll give you a quick capsule of what it's about. Operation Zebra was particularly cumbersome and involved and challenging 
And yes, Al Schwimmer led it and he led it magnificently, but he was the first to say it. He insisted on this when we met. We spent a week together and, and he would repeat this more than anything else. I didn't do this alone. His operation ballooned to 300 people over two years. It became Israel's Air Force. It later also became El Al, Israel's national airline. And it was assisted by hundreds of other people in Israel, in the United States, in Europe, and around the world. So we're gonna discuss some of these people today. We're gonna to really talk about them. And, and you know, it, it, the same goes for, for, for research, right? I, I do all this research, but I'm always aided by, by folks around, around me. You know, it's snowing today. I don't know if it's snowing where you are. We have about half a foot of snow already in two hours. And I'm thinking of the snowball effect, this program is a snowball effect because one of you, I wish I could remember who, I, Olivia, someone suggested in the chat last time, two months ago, that we do this program. It was someone's idea and that's a snowball effect. And the way I conducted this research was similar. Most of these guys were hiding. They didn't wanna talk. They didn't wanna be known. And the only way to get to them was through someone that they knew as part of the operation. And so I would meet with one, get to know them, earn their trust, interview them, and they would then recommend me to the next one and so forth. And I ended up having 30 of them. And I was making a film for uh, PBS and PBS you know, is stingy with their time. I was hoping they'd give me an hour and a half. I dreamed of two hours, they only gave me one hour. Well, I couldn't fit all 30. I could only fit about half of them, really only about a dozen of the people I interviewed. And being Jewish, that uh, induced a lot of guilt in me. I can tell you that, a lot, a lot of guilt. Well, that guilt was alleviated when I received a phone call from Roman and Littlefield uh, offering me to write a book. I said, great, this is my chance now. This is my chance to write a book, meaning I have room. No one's gonna tell me who to include or not to include, how long I have. I have as many pages as I want. Well, I was restricted, but to 90,000 words. And so I was able to include all these people all these people who made a difference. And we're gonna learn about Yehuda Arazi and we're gonna learn about Sam Lewis from their family members. But I'll begin by giving you one example. One example, uh, Matt, if you get a chance, maybe kick up his, his photo, we'll take a look at Eddie Stirak. Eddie Stirak was a member of the operation. So first, let me remind you what this operation was. In 1947 and 48, as Israel was preparing to become a state, it faced a massive invasion by its neighboring countries. Seven in total, really. Uh, six, um, six made it, but seven were threatening to attack. Six of them made it, and Israel uh, looked like it was going to be uh, destroyed as soon as it was born. It didn't look good because Israel lacked the weapons. It didn't have an air force. It didn't have enough bullets. It didn't have enough rifles. It just didn't have enough in terms of military instruments to become a state it was going to be demolished. So this operation, Operation Zebra, was a secret and illegal operation that saved Israel. It's that simple. And as I mentioned, it had many members, although initially it only had a few, and it grew and it grew and it grew. We see Sam Lewis here in the first slide. Now I wanna to move to the second slide and show you Eddie Stirak. So Eddie Stirak, right there on the right. Eddie Stirak, the reason I'm singling him out is in some ways because he was a typical member of the operation in a sense that he brought his own strengths, his own story to it. They were each unique. I can, I can spend just as long speaking about the other two are next to him, Norman Munitz with a bandage on his face and right there, Shelly Eichel, uh, with whom I became very, very close until the day he died. And, uh, you know, they're all fascinating. Eddie was a radio operator, but what made him unique was the fact that he was also a leader. So, Radio operators were crucial to the operation, but they had a very difficult time recruiting them for some reason. And he played a key role. Most of the radio operators, especially in the beginning, came through his connections. He brought them on board. Many of them were not Jewish. He also was just a morale booster. He was always positive. And, and when there were obstacles and there were problems and, and they faced them on a daily basis, he was there raising the morale, being optimistic, you know, pushing for people to remain focused, uh, keep your eye on the prize was one of the things he would say. And he was also the resident reader. He was also the resident reader. He 
was the one who followed the news and distilled it for them and most of the news, maybe it was just that, you know, it was just news and maybe it didn't matter. But a lot of what happened in the news directly affected the operation. For instance, on December 5th, 1947, the US implemented an arms embargo. Suddenly it became illegal to bring any weapons to Israel. Well, that directly affected them. And then there were other lesser known steps along the way. They restricted the weight. They restricted the State Department at some point in 1948 restricted the weight capacity of planes that were allowed to leave the states. And guess what? Of course, all of the 13 planes that the operation had here in the United States, those big transport planes that they bought to be able to take with them equipment and then to airlift the weapons out of Czechoslovakia, they all exceeded that weight. So they were all grounded as of April 15th, 1948. So you know, Eddie was, was the guy who read the news, looked at what was going on and brought it to them all the time. So he played a key role. But here's what's interesting about Eddie also. He grew up, he grew up in an anti-Semitic home. He told me his own parents who were Catholics from Poland, hated Jews and spoke against Jews and blamed everyone's problems on Jews. That's the kind of environment he grew up in. He was not a hateful person, so I don't know that he ever became an anti-Semite himself, but he described his feelings as more ambivalent, like it wasn't something that was on his radar. He didn't care about Israel or the Jews. He didn't care until he liberated Dhaka. And when he liberated Dhaka in Europe, the Nazi death camp, everything changed for him. And he saw the survivors. And what really burned them up, what really upset him, yes, of course, what happened to them before, of course, but when looking at the survivors, knowing that they had nowhere to go, they had nowhere to go, no one wanted them. 250,000 of them were stuck in Europe, many in the same Nazi concentration camps in which they spent the previous few years trying to make it out alive. And he decided that he was going to devote his life to making a difference. So he joined one of the Aliyah Bet ships. Those are the ships that try to bring in all of these Holocaust survivors, right? And often failed. And his own ship, the Ben Hecht, it also failed. <laughs> and the, the British were able to intercept them and take him away. And Eddie Stirak, along with his other teammates on that ship, were taken to Akko, to Accra in Israel, to an all crusader, um, you know, used to be a crusader castle and now became a prison. And he spent four months there. He spent four months in this prison. And then when he got out, he wanted to do more. And that's how he found the operation and he joined it. And when I spoke to him in a nursing home outside of San Francisco about 10 years ago, and, and, and Matt, maybe if you can keep up this picture for a second, actually. Uh, one of the things that really moved me is at some point, he showed me a couple of injuries. Now, he was already 90 years old at the time. He was only about five months away from his death when I interviewed him. And those injuries were ones that he suffered in 1948, when he and Shelley and Norm, when the three of them flew into Israel and crashed. They were bringing in their cargo on the C-46 as part of Operation Zebra, half a Messerschmitt because these Messerschmitt fighter planes that they had purchased in Czechoslovakia could not be flown directly to Israel. They would have had to make too many stops to refuel. So they took them apart and put half in one C-46 and the other half in another C-46. They flew them in and they crashed and here he is in a hospital in Israel in May of 1948. So Eddie is, is one example, right? Of, of, of these amazing people that make up the operation. And, and when I think of this operation, I think of concentric circles. It, there's the nucleus of people like, you know, obviously Al Schwimmer and Sam Lewis, who was the chief pilot. And then there are other circles of support. Yudha Razi, I would also very much put in the co-circle then there's the other circle right around them of people like Eddie Sterak and Sherry Eichel. And then there's other layers. And, and the next one who we can put in an other 
layer would be the next slide, who I think is Frank Sinatra, if I can remember. Yes, Fra what's Frank Sinatra doing here? And I'm cognizant of time, don't worry, I'm paying attention to my time. So I'll try to go a little faster now. How was Frank Sinatra involved? Frank Sinatra, by the way, in the late 40s was at the top of his game, at the height of his popularity and used to perform at the Copacabana. The Copacabana was a famous club in the same building as the Aganaz secret operation uh, office, which was called Jaffa Oranges. And Al Schwimmer and some of them got to know him and he was helpful. Why was he helpful? He was a Zionist. He was a Zionist. He believed, by the way, he was a man who believed in equal rights for everyone. He spoke out not just for Jews. He spoke out for African-Americans and many others. And he wanted to help and he helped in many ways, including delivering funds to the seaport to help some shipments of weapons get out to bribe about a million dollars worth, by the way, quite a lot of money that he delivered. And he connected Al and the operation with the mafia. He was able to connect them to the mafia and both the Jewish mafia for maybe more obvious reasons and the Italian mafia, both of those mafias helped, it helped the operation along the way in many ways. Primarily, most importantly, besides giving them some weapons, etc., was to allow them to use Sicily as a refueling stop in Europe. A key refueling stop of Sicily was set up by the mafia, and that began with Frank Sinatra. So let's go to the next slide. I believe, I believe the next slide is Golda. Me no, it's Eleanor Resnick. Uh, Rodnick, I'm sorry. Eleanor Rodnick. And I, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll speak very fast. Eleanor Rudnick became famous for being a flight instructor. She taught 13 Israelis how to fly in Bakersfield, California, which is wonderful. To be honest, you know, only two of them really became pilots and, and not till later. What made her really important to the operation is she helped them hide and smuggle spare parts, spare engines, equipment, as well as weapons for not the weapons. They were never caught for the fact that they stole machine guns from the Navy. They would have spent a lot of time in prison if they were caught for that. But she did face a trial like the men, like the nine other men on the operation, the, the core group. And she was convicted and became a convicted felon, lost her uh, civil rights because of her help to the operation. And now let's look at the last slide before we go to Sam Lewis. And that is Golda Meir. So I'm sure most of you know Golda, Golda Meir, who was then Golda Meyerson. She becomes Israeli uh, prime minister in the late 60s, was the prime minister when I was a kid. Uh, you may wonder, how is she connected? Well, they needed money for this operation. They needed money to be able to buy all these weapons. The deal with the check to buy all the weapons that they needed cost $11 million. So in January, of 1948, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's founding father, sent Golda to the United States to raise money. The goal was $5 million, quite a lot. She arrives in Chicago on a January Sunday, not unlike today, and is given this impromptu opportunity to speak to the Jewish federations while having their general assembly. She had not prepared a speech, so she spoke off the cuff for about half an hour and told him, frankly, look, <laughs> I, we are desperate. We don't get this money. We don't get these weapons. We're dead. It's, it's as simple as that. She was very frank. And that launched her campaign. And in less than two months, she went back to Israel less than, about seven weeks later, she came back with 50 million, five zero, 50 million, 10 times the enormous amount that David Ben-Gurion had set for her. So you can see just by these very quick kind of snippets of these folks, how they all contributed to making this complex, multifaceted operation run. And now we're gonna talk about a key, key member of the operation. Sandra Brown is gonna describe the role that her father, Sam Lewis, the chief pilot played. Sandra, it's all yours. Hello. My father, Sam Lewis, had a fascinating and colorful career in aviation. I'm here today to talk about some of his adventures in Israel's 48 War of Independence. But if there were time, I could tell you wonderful stories about 
his early flying days in Los Angeles, um, his flying overseas for Air Transport Command, flying on the magic carpet, bringing rescued Yemenites into Israel. And then after the war, his career as an El Al captain and after retirement from El Al, his work with Israel Aircraft Industries. Sticking to the 48 war period though, I chose a few of the many stories he told of his involvement in the secret smuggling operation and the war effort that led to the establishment of the State of Israel and the Israeli Air Force. Al Schwimmer and my dad occasionally flew together in TWA ATC during World War II. So when Al came up with the idea of flying Jews from the DP camps that were on Cyprus at that time directly to Palestine to avoid the British blockade of ships, he enlisted my father to find Jewish pilots in Southern California who would be willing to do this type of flying. Others were doing this recruiting all over the country. Matt, please start the first slide. Um, there was enough money available so Al could buy 10 C-46s and three constellations from Army Surplus. Here is a constellation being overhauled at Burbank Airport. When the planes were ready, my dad trained the pilots and started the rescue in order to start the rescue airlift. But when it looked like five Arab countries would be attacking the new state of Israel and the Jews desperately needed a way to get planes, arms, and ammunition, Al changed the operation to flying the arms and equipment into Israel instead of the refugees. In the meantime, the embargo that Boaz was describing was imposed by the US, so it became illegal to fly large planes and equipment into Israel. So to get the weapons and planes into Israel, they needed airfields to train the pilots and have locations close enough to fly the equipment into Israel. So first, a fake airline was established in Panama. All the planes except one, which had crashed, made it there. The subterfuge meant that the Panamanians thought all these planes were part of their new national airline. My dad was the chief pilot of this secret operation and used this Panamanian airport to train the pilots on the C-46s. The one constellation was his domain. The other two Connies had been impounded by the uh, FBI on the East Coast. And then there was Zatech, the crucial airfield in Czechoslovakia, which the Czechs agreed to let Israel use so they could fly their equipment into and out of Israel. The Czechs needed the money and had lots of World War II equipment to sell to Israel as well as to the Arabs. All the while the FBI was closing in on the operation in Panama, there were spies it was all very cloak and dagger to get the planes out of Panama just in time. Once all the planes made it to Czechoslovakia, my father continued as chief pilot of the big airlift. The training continued and the transport operation continued. When my parents returned to LA after 35 years living abroad, I started working with my dad on his extensive oral history. You can imagine how much exciting information there would have been in that. I used audio and video, and in preparing for this talk, to refresh my memory of some details, I reread some of these amazing stories. Since my father was a fine storyteller, I thought it would be more interesting to read aloud some of what he narrated directly. So here is part of the story he told about his first delivery flight into Israel. And I quote, 
Eventually, we started to move the equipment from Zatech to an airport in the Negev area. It was my first flight with the Constellation to come into Israel, and I was ordered at a much higher than normal takeoff weight with a plane load of Czech machine guns. It was an emergency. The war started. We were running out of arms, and there was nothing to fight with. These Biza machine guns were essential, absolutely essential to the survival of the state at that point in time. The airfield was very difficult to find. There were no lights. I came in on three engines. I had to shut an engine down. As we approached the airfield, a single light came on. And as I made my approach, the radio operator yells out, Cyclone, do not land, do not land. We haven't got permission. It was the ne nearest thing I've ever had to cracking up this airplane. Barely, barely, heavily overloaded, only three engines running. <laughs> it took all my skill, all my experience. I worked the airplane, struggled in the air, staggered around. Then my radio operator said, yes, we're clear to land. And I came on in. Those machine guns, those visas, I can say with all honesty, was the biggest event in turning around the war from almost a defeat to victory. Can you imagine, here's an army and they had nothing really to shoot back with. And here are 1500 brand new medium sized machine guns with ammunition, with went, which went to the front line that very same night, end quote. Matt, put on the next slide, please. Another interesting story has to do with converting C-46s, which were transport planes, into bombers. My father says, and I quote, it was very primitive but effective. Bombs were loaded into the cabin. They were thrown out of the rear door upon command from the cockpit. We had bomb chuckers, young cadets in the back who would drop four 100 kilo bombs at the same time from like a wheelbarrow, which was tipped over by hand out the door. It was effective. It was a bomber, end quote. There are many, many other exciting adventures I could tell you about, but now we'll talk about the end of the operation and the trial that took place in Los Angeles for breaking the embargo. Matt, next slide, please. Here you see my father, Natalie, dressed as always, with Al Schwimmer and two others of the group in Tel Aviv around the time they were deciding whether to turn themselves in. My father tells, and I quote, all 10 of us, Al Schwimmer and I and eight others, were told that we were under indictment. We could either be fugitives or give ourselves up. We had a meeting in Tel Aviv and decided to give ourselves up. The advice I got was that the Jewish agency, the state of Israel would be behind us. The arrests and trial were to take place at the federal building in Los Angeles because the original smuggling crime took place in LA. The smuggling out of the 10 C-46s and one constellation. I was locked up temporarily for around two hours behind bars. Charges and bail were forthcoming. The charge was conspiracy to violate the Neutrality Act. The trial dragged on and on for nine months of testimony, although we did not have to testify. Everyone was found guilty, except me. I was acquitted because I was considered by one of the jurors, a young woman, that I was just a professional pilot used by these people, that I was just guilty of flying an airplane and had no part of the conspiracy. Eventually, hundreds and hundreds of letters came into the judge asking for leniency for the others, so nobody of this group went to jail. Everyone was fined $10,000 each and convicted as felons, including Eleanor Rudnick, as Boaz was telling you about but I was set free. The Jewish agency paid the fines. Over the years, all of them were pardoned." End quote. 
Matt, the next slide, please. As soon as the trial was over, my dad went back to Israel to become the first chief pilot of El Al. The original three constellations and some of the C-46s became part of El Al's fleet. My father flew for El Al until his mandatory retirement age at age 60. He then worked again with Al Schwimmer at Israel Aircraft Industries for another 10 very interesting action-packed years. When my parents moved back to LA, it gave me such a wonderful opportunity to be able to work with my dad on his oral history. Not only could I preserve his stories, but also contribute to help preserve this important piece of history. And now Yehuda. Thank you, I'll, I'll uh, step in for a minute. Uh, thank you, Sandra, so much. You know, in traveling the world and speaking to these operation members, um, I often was lucky and got to speak directly with them, but other times they were gone and I had to interview and speak with family members. And all of them were wonderful and helpful, but none, none was as helpful as Sandra. The work you've done, Sandra, in, in interviewing your dad and writing everything down and cataloging the photos, it was tremendous, it was amazing. And Sam Lewis was so key to this operation. And yet for many years, I think before I connected with you, he was left out of all the books. He was left out of the archives. Um, it was just strange. Sometimes the, some of these people are forgotten. When he was the chief pilot, and, and I, when I interviewed everyone, I would always ask, especially the operation members, to tell me about the other operation members, right? That was part of the research. And every single one of them always mentioned, uh, Sandra mentioned your dad, mentioned Sam Lewis, because he taught them how to fly. Now they came in knowing how to fly, but not necessarily how to fly these planes. Take Lulanard. Lulanard was a fighter pilot. And Sam Lewis taught him how to fly a C-46, which he did briefly, he then went back to being a fighter pilot. But, you know, he, he was just there helping every day and making a huge difference. And he might have been forgotten completely from history if it wasn't for you, Sandra. So thank you again for doing that. Uh, before we get to the Jewish James Bond, uh, to Yehuda Arazi, I'll also say, you know, there's all these connections, right? And you're always looking for them. So for instance, I mentioned Eddie Sterak and I mentioned Frank Sinatra. Well, they were both connected to Ben Hecht, who was Ben Hecht, a Jewish playwright who pushed for not just Zionism in the 40s, but for also trying to save the Jews of Europe during and after the Holocaust. He pushed for that. And Eddie Sterak was on the Ben Hecht, which was a ship that Ben Hecht had purchased and paid for. And Frank Sinatra performed in a play that Ben Hecht wrote in 1943 to raise awareness about the Holocaust. He knew about it, people knew about it, but nothing was done. And so to a large degree, this operation was to make up for that. The fact that, that very little was done to help the Jews during the Holocaust. And here to them, they were staring at perhaps a second Holocaust because the Arabs were threatening to demolish the 600,000 Jews that were living in Palestine. Would they have done it? We don't know, but they were saying they were gonna complete the work that Hitler started. They were gonna finish the final solution. And Yehuda Razi was one of the key people that stood between them. And I think he made a, a huge difference in every step of the way. And we can spend hours talking about it. But I think we're going to focus on the fact that in late 1947, he was sent by David Megurion to New York to head up the Agena office that we mentioned in the Hotel 14, the same building that housed the Copa, which, by the way, one of the people among our audience members today just mentioned on the chat was the place where she had her Sweet 16 party. <laughs> so these connections are incredible. So Yehuda Raza comes to New York. And that made all the difference in the world. His namesake, Yehuda Razi, please tell us. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boaz. So uh, my understanding is from all the people that were involved in the Hotel 14 that Yehuda Arazi was the only one that believed in uh, Al Schwimmer and Al Schwimmer's idea of Israel needs an air force 
in order to win any type of a war. Um, it's very important just to backtrack just a little bit uh, what you were saying and Sandra was saying about the time that we're in and to understand the embargo, it was, there was no other way of getting ammunition, airplanes, anything to Israel, only through clandestine activity, illegally, underground. So when Sandra says that her, everybody was exonerated, it was the only way that that Israel could get equipped, you know, with anything. Um, and I wanted to let everybody know that I actually, uh, Matt, if you don't mind showing the first slide, I actually am proud to say that I am the grandson of Yehuda Arazi, who was one of the top eight most wanted in the Middle East. And it's a very funny story why he was most wanted. And I'm going to explain this to you. This poster was actually a two foot by three foot poster. And, uh, during the time of the British mandate, the British would recruit people to help um, with the population. And one of the people that they recruited was my grandfather, Yehuda Arazi, who made it uh, high up in the ranks. He made it all the way to uh, an officer in the British police. And he learned how to utilize his uh, documents, how to utilize his knowledge, to take huge caches of um, ammunition and deliver them to kibbutzes and deliver them throughout all of Israel in his personal car uh, to arm them so that they can fight in the war. And there are a number of uh, very, very funny stories um, about uh, some of how he got away with his things and how he was able to uh, deliver these um, these, um, the, the ammunition and these weapons that he was able to smuggle to uh, the different, like I said, um, kibbutzim and the different areas that he was able to send it. And one of um, the things that I read uh, both in Boaz's book and in other books about my grandfather is that um, not only did he have blue piercing eyes, but he had a limp. He walked with a pronounced limp. and. The reason why he had the limp is being uh, wanted in Israel, he was running away from uh, the British police and he jumped on the back of a motorcycle and his foot got caught in the spokes of the motorcycle. And that's why he had um, this pronounced limp. Now he did have to go because he was um, quote unquote most wanted. There was actually a 5,000 sterling reward for his capture. Um, he did have to go into hiding and he went into hiding for two years and he did, uh, Matt, if you can bring up the next uh, slide, please. He did regularly have to go um, undercover and this is him as uh, Dr. Bergman. Um, my understanding, there is a book written in Hebrew called King of the Ruses. Um, he was constantly going undercover under many different names, many different identities in this two years that he was wanted from, um, from the British police, this is him uh, dressed up as Dr. Bergman. And he would also, I understood, be disguised as a pilot, as a rabbi. Um, I do know my middle name, Alon, that um, all of his assignments were from Ben Gurion directly. And many times he would just sign the alias Alon. But uh, one of the books written about my grandfather in Hebrew is called King of the Ruses because he um, would constantly go under um, different disguises. Um, at the end of the two years, he was actually smuggled out of uh, Palestine and he had to go um, very, very high security, very um, uh, high security and with a number of bodyguards and escorts, he got out of Israel and eventually made it to um, Italy. And in Italy, uh, there was an event, if you can go to the uh, next slide, please, now. In the port of La Spazia, Italy, uh, where my grandfather was trying to get, um, I believe it was Boaz that mentioned earlier, a lot of these uh, refugees out of the concentration camps, they 
made their way out of Europe. Uh, they made their way out of uh, Germany, excuse me. And my grandfather got them to Italy. In the meantime, he had to hide these refugees and um, hide them, hide ammunition, hide throughout the whole time until the ship was ready to have them sail to Palestine. And this was one of the ships in the port of Aspasia. This is a sign on the port. Um, and this particular ship had 1,014 uh, refugees. They were trying to get to Palestine and basically almost at the shores of Palestine, the British came on board and they caused quite a ruckus. I believe they killed um, two passengers. There was a strike uh, for 40 hours, but it brought so much media attention that uh, they weren't turned back to, um, they weren't turned back to uh, Italy, but rather they made it into Palestine. And one of the stories that I heard was that the British were told that if this ship would not be admitted into Palestine, they would have to deal with my grandfather directly. And within hours, it was um, turned to uh, Palestine and all of the um, refugees made it. Um, this was also the inspiration to the movie um, Exodus with uh, Paul Newman, the character Ari Ben Knaan was based on uh, my grandfather um, in this particular event. And um, the next slide um, that I wanted to show, um, this is my grandfather um, after his activities of smuggling both ammunition and refugees and the first planes. Um, he did become um, a businessman, and this is him in his uh, civilian life as a businessman. He did open the Ramada Aviv Hotel, and Boaz, I believe, Frank Sinatra did perform there. Um, the Ramada Aviv Hotel was very unique at the time. It was a bungalow-style hotel, the only of its kind in all of Israel, and this picture was actually at the entrance. I remember it as a little kid um, seeing this picture at the entrance. Um, of the uh, hotel. And um, that's it. Thank you, Yehuda. I know, Olivia, that our time is up. There's a lot, lot more to say. I just want to say real quick before you take it over, Olivia, just to remind everyone the importance of this. So when Yehuda Razi came to New York in late 1947, he came to procure weapons, and then he quickly realized he couldn't do that in the United States because of the arms embargo. He also quickly realized that the war was already starting because it started the day after the UN partitioned Palestine. It didn't really begin in May 1948. It started in late November of 1947. So he had to move. And he immediately connected with Al Schwimmer and said, go ahead, do it. Build us an air force. Do it now. Do it in secret. Do it illegally. And do it yourself. And put a good team around you. And that's what this is all about. Olivia, it's all yours. Thanks, Boaz. Uh, we will turn back to our speakers in just a little bit for some Q&A, and I encourage people to put some questions in to the chat box. I don't know how many we'll have time for, but please feel free to put your questions in there. Right now, I just want to make a plug for our upcoming programs. So we have our Sunday programs all set for the rest of January. We also have uh, programs beyond that that are not yet announced that are equally exciting. So. After today's program, you will get an email inviting you to sign up for our next programs. Um, there are two ways to sign up. One is to get season tickets and a season ticket allows you to have access to every Sunday program of the whole year. You don't have to worry about deadlines or registering. We will take care of everything. So that is obviously the easiest way to do it. Otherwise you can continue to sign up individually for different programs. And for those of you, I know that there are many people who are with us week after week, uh, and uh, you have donated in conjunction with these programs because some of them do have fees attached. So those donations will count towards the season ticket price. So if that is of interest, please let us know and we will make it happen. Um, as I said, some of our programs are free as is today, and some have tickets attached. Next week is one such program. We are going to be seeing a really special film. 
is called Broken Branches. And it's a film made by a granddaughter of her grandmother. This grandmother was born in Poland and came to Israel or Palestine in 1936 under the, Aliyah, uh, under the um, uh, Youth Aliyah program. Uh, and so we're going to have the filmmaker with us. She's not only a filmmaker, but an animator. And her film is really something very special. So she will be with us. We also have an expert on the history of Youth Aliyah, uh, who is Professor Shulamit Reinhartz from Brandeis. And we have the chair of Youth Aliyah today, uh, who is Marcy Natan. And Marcy Natan is the past president of Hadassah. So she will bring the program into today and explain how Youth Aliyah has continued. So if, um, anyway, it's gonna be a fabulous program. I do encourage all of you to sign up. We just have a little video to play for you. It's not exactly the trailer to the film. It was, uh, it was a little video made when they had a Kickstarter program to raise some funds for the film. So it comes with a little pitch for money. Ignore that, but at least you'll see the filmmaker in there. You'll see her process. And it's a little minute and a half video. So enjoy. This is Michal, my grandmother. At the age of 14, she left her home and traveled to Palestine by herself. She didn't know that she would never see her family again. And this is where I come in. My name is Ayala and I'm an animator. I believe that my grandmother's story makes a great film and that the best way to tell it is by using animation. Throughout the film I used various animation styles. Her fourth grade drawings are brought to life with hand-drawn animation. The Jewish village is inspired by Marc Chagall's paintings. And my grandmother's faded memories are visualized by oil and glass animation. So, here's where you come in. Creating 25 minutes of animation is a hard and long process. But luckily, I have a great team with me. And most of the budget is covered by the Israeli Rabinovich Foundation. But this is not enough. We need more money to complete our animation budget. Bringing in more animators who can provide their talented skills and extra hands to help me finish the film on time. If you support our project, you can get the coolest gifts ever. Framed limited edition prints from the film, original artwork, exclusive preview screenings and some cool memorabilia. We even have five invitations for an afternoon tea with my grandmother and me. Join our journey and be a part of Broken Branches. Great. So I again encourage all of you to sign up for next week's program and the programs to come. So now let's turn to some questions from the audience. And Boaz, I believe this question is maybe for you. And it is as follows. I cannot find information about Operation Zebra online. Perhaps you can summarize what the operation was. Operation Zebra took place between 1947 and 1949. It was an operation to allow the Jewish state to survive its first war. So the operation targeted the key necessities, beginning with actual weapons. I mentioned in the last talk that we had that on the first day of fighting, Israel could only activate a third of its troops because it only had one rifle for every three soldiers. It had only enough bullets to last for maybe a couple of days. So this operation, Operation Zebra, brought in weapons to supply the troops, which eventually um, it did fully. In other words, all 60,000 troops were deployed within a few weeks of the war, and that by itself really saved Israel. Those weapons had to be brought in illegally. They were breaking many laws along the way in the US and elsewhere, including the UN's international arms embargo. Uh, so that was one aspect of the operation. The other was to give Israel an air force. The operation not only met the need, it created the need because the Israelis, other than Yehuda Arazi, did not seek an air force. It was something that Yehuda Arazi wanted, I wanted, and they had to bring and show to the Israelis how much they needed it. 
It ended up being almost as well, or you could argue just as crucial as the weapons, and really saved Israel because the Arabs in the first two weeks of the war had complete control of the skies. So they were bombing Tel Aviv, they were supporting their ground troops. It was really impossible, even with weapons, for Israel to make it. But when the Israelis flew up and started to dogfight the Arabs, push him away from Tel Aviv, eventually actually even gain control of the skies, that changed everything. And Israel went not only from surviving, but thriving and ended up with a much bigger share of Palestine, now Israel, than was given to them by the United Nations in the first place, including all of the Negev, all of it. So that was number two. The, number th the third thing that the operation did was to send supplies. So I mentioned the Negev. One of the reasons they were able to hold on to the Negev is because the operation brought supplies to the besieged soldiers in the Negev who otherwise would have starved to death or wouldn't have had enough weaponry or, or other equipment to make it. So that was the third aspect. And there were several others. So that was the operation. It was an operation mostly by Americans, but by others as well, South Africans, et cetera, a few Israelis that saved Israel by giving Israel what it lacked and what no one else would give it except this operation, Operation Zebra. And the reason there's very little information about it, so few people know about it is number one, it was secret and illegal and people kept quiet about it actually for decades. It wasn't just, it was over and now we can talk about it. No, the US-Israel relation uh, that we know today didn't exist till the seventies. Um, you know, and number two, by the time they were able to talk about it, people lost interest. And it clashes with our understanding. For instance, we believe America and Israel are best friends. This story tells us otherwise. So it kind of disappeared into the fringes of history, but we are bringing it back, aren't we? So before we get to the final thoughts of our speakers, there is one more question. And I think it's again for you, Boaz. And the question is, can you please talk about the political reasons behind the neutrality decision and the US embargo of arms against Israel? Yeah, so the United States uh, reactivated the Neutrality Act. The Neutrality Act, there were three of them in the 1930s, the last one being in 1939. And they were meant to keep Americans out of the escalating global conflict that became World War II. You know, World War II didn't just happen one day, 1939 on some February 1st. <laughs> it escalated over several years and, and the United States initially, as we know, officially tried to stay out of it. The Neutrality Act was meant to keep Americans from getting involved. It obviously was dormant um, and kind of forgotten until suddenly Truman in 1947 reactivated it with the strict purpose of keeping Americans out of the Middle Eastern conflict. And then if that wasn't enough, at the end of 1947, he signs an embargo, an arms embargo, not allowing not just the US government, but any company, any entity, anyone from giving any kind of military support to, in a sense, the Jewish state. Again, you can argue they wouldn't do it for the Arabs, but I, I, as I explained before in our last talk, uh, the British were arming the Arabs and the US didn't try to enforce that arms embargo with them. So it really only affected the Jews in the Middle East. Why? The question is why? I wanted to summarize what it was. Pretty simple, actually. I may disagree with it myself, but I understand it. I do. I actually understand it. I don't agree with it. And that is, it was in America's interest, or so they believed at the time, it was in America's interest to prevent the, creating, the creation of a Jewish state. Because the creation of a Jewish state could give either an excuse or an opening for the Soviet Union to get involved in the Middle East. It could give rise to a war in which the Soviet Union was involved and could force America to get involved and America didn't wanna do that. It would anger the Arabs, the Arabs would need it. Even though the United States at the time had plenty of its own oil and the Middle Eastern oil complex was only emerging, thinking long-term, the Americans understood we are going to need this oil in years to come. We're gonna need the Arabs. So. It was very clear to Americans in key positions like George Marshall, the Secretary of State, who were not at all anti-Semitic, that the creation of a Jewish state would go against American interests. And that was the reason they opposed it. It was, it was pretty simple. Sad, uh, maybe short-sighted, but understandable. So Truman was both a good guy and a bad guy, sounds like. 
Truman was a fascinating guy. Uh, his heart told him to support the Jews. His head told him to listen to George Marshall and oppose the creation of a Jewish state. So he isolated, he kept going back and forth. He would do something to help the Jews and the next day do something else. So the, U, the US votes for the UN partition plan allowing for the creation of a Jewish state. And less than a week later, they institute, they enact the arms embargo, which in a sense says, you know what? We might allow you to do it, but you're not going anywhere. You're not gonna make it. Yeah, it was kind of schizophrenic actually. And tell me of these 10 people who were put on trial nine found guilty, one acquitted. Those nine, they lost their civil rights. They, they were convicted felons. Were they all eventually pardoned? So there were 12 people in total from the operation who were put on trial. There were four trials, two in Los Angeles and uh, two in Florida, actually. Of the 12, only Sam Lewis was exonerated. The others, <laughs> as we know, the other 11 were found guilty. By the way, you know, please, Sandra, don't take this the wrong way. I mean it as a compliment. Sam was a ladies' man, so I'm not surprised that a female juror uh, let him off. Yeah, like he wasn't part of the conspiracy. He was right there with them all the way from day one. <laughs> anyway, regardless, uh, of the 11, one, one went to prison, spent 18 months in a Florida prison in Tallahassee. Uh, Charlie Winters, a non-Jew, actually. And the others were either let go for time served all were just fined. They all lost their civil rights and three of the 12, only three were pardoned. Only three were pardoned. Uh, Al Schwimmer, Charlie Winters, and Hank Greenspan. Those were the three who over the years by three different presidents were pardoned. So now we're going to turn to final thoughts of our speakers, starting with Yehuda and then turning to Sandra and ending with Boaz. So Yehuda, what would you like to say to our audience? Um, just want to, as a final thought, um, the information that everybody has gotten today, I can tell you that the current generation in Israel, the younger generation, is not privy to the information that, that, that you learn today. And if you do want to learn more, there actually are books written. Number one, I obviously want to mention Boaz is Saving Israel, Boaz Dvir. Um, Angels in the Sky is another one that talks about what we talked about today. That's by Robert Gant, G-A-N-D-T. Um, the Pledge by Leonard Slater, and in particular in The Pledge, if you are going to read it, it's a very suspenseful book. Page 127, the chapter is entitled Yehuda Arazi, so please uh, pay attention to that. And also O Jerusalem by Larry Collins and Dominique Lapierre. And the last one, um, which talks more about Sandra's uh, father and his involvement, it's called El All, A Star in the Sky by Marvin Goldman. And uh, you do have accessibility to these books. You can read more um, about these and see pictures of the characters that were involved. Sandra, I think you can now. Yeah, as you could hear, my father had a remarkable career in aviation, but the 1947 to 50 years when he played a vital role in the establishment of the State of Israel and the Israeli Air Force were the most meaningful and rewarding. He didn't start out as a Zionist, but soon came to want to participate in every way he could to help Israel survive. He loved adventure and action and challenges. So this was a perfect role for him. In visiting Israel over the years, I would so enjoy hearing him referred to as, quote, hero of Israel. My sister and I were always very proud of him and his accomplishments as his grandchildren and great-grandchildren continue to be. Boaz, the last word goes to you. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm afraid we won't be able to get to all the questions. I apologize, but maybe those, you can find the answers in books, etc. cetera. Um, I would say that again, you know, the point is that you need a team, you need a team. When you look, for instance, I don't know if you've watched The Last Dance, about the Chicago Bulls. You know, we all know Michael Jordan, but if he didn't have Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant and all these other characters around him, he wouldn't have won a single championship. And the same for here. Al Schwimmer was an extraordinary leader, once in a generation, almost biblical, really. But he wouldn't have done a thing. And he was the first to say it without Sam Lewis and without Yehuda Arazi and without Golda Meir and Frank Sinatra and Eddie Stirak. And, and that's the point. And guess what? I mean, we're, we're in the middle of that too. 
there's an operation right now, Operation Wolf Speed, maybe it will take on a different name and we can all play a role, right? We can all do our part in terms of educating people about the vaccines, wearing our masks, paying attention, socially distancing. You might say, well, that's not the same as saving Israel. You could save lives. That's what we can do today. And maybe perhaps in other realms as well. So I encourage you to find your own spot on a team and make a difference. Wonderful. So we had a great, wonderful, big crowd today. I counted 623 people at the height. So this is really fabulous. And it's very nice to see that our Sunday programs have become so popular. We can accommodate a thousand people in our Zoom room. So please do spread the word. We want more and more people on these Sunday programs. And we hope all of you will sign up for next week and the weeks to come. So thank you for giving us some of your Sunday. Thank you to our fabulous speakers and see you soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Shalom. Thank you.